I was designed to save the world. People who have looked to the sky and see hope. I'll take that from them first. There's only one path to peace. There are extinction. Try to create a suit of armor around the world. But I created something terrible. Artificial intelligence. It's called the Ultron program. I'm sick of watching people pay for our mistakes. Isn't why we fight so we can end the fight and go home? Well, you amazingly failed. Here we all are. Nothing but our wit and our will to save the world. So stand and fight. No way we all get through this. I got no plans tomorrow night. I'm always picking up after you, boys. We can tear them apart. From the inside. That's the best you can do! <laughs> you had to ask. and welcome to GeekFest Rants. My name is Carlos Barron, and joining me today, I have Steve Avona. Say hi, Steve. Hey, Carlos. Well, as promised, you know, we had our Avengers commentary a couple of episodes ago, and it was obviously leading up to what was coming next, and that is Age of Ultron. We both had a chance to watch the movie, and boy, this is a movie that had a lot writing on it and a movie that had a lot of pressure, I think, because... Avengers was such an amazing gathering of all these Marvel movie stars into mm -hmm. one movie. And this is a new beast we have now. And that is, this is the team-up sequel, yeah. <laughs> which we haven't had a team-up sequel yet. No. So, Steve, why don't you tell us a little bit first about the main story is Ultron. So, tell us who the heck is this Ultron according to the comic book? Well, according to the comics, uh, Ultron was this uh, artificial intelligence that was created by Hank Pym. Now, Hank Pym oh. is the character that Michael Douglas is playing in Ant-Man, oh, so man. the that obviously went out the window, <laughs> but it's fine. You know, in, in the movies, uh, the MCU, it's going to, Ultron is created by Tony Stark, which again, makes sense. It, it makes sense for- uh, Keep it in what the family. <laughs> yeah, what they've established to this point. It really uh, just kind of flowed naturally. And I wasn't uh, angry or upset that because, you know, it took them a while to get to Hank Pym. And, uh, you know, he wasn't established in time, I guess, for them to make him the creator of Ultron. But with everything that's gone on since the original Iron Man, it it, it, it just makes sense. It's it's fine. And Tony yes, is it, the brainiac in the group. Uh, yeah. Not, not, and, the su not, not the villain brainiac, but right. the, the actual smart guy. So you give him yeah. those those credits. Right. So, you know, in the comic, like in the movie, he's sort of this childlike, you know, intelligence to begin with, who very quickly th believes after he is uh, created that humans are, you know, not the first time we've heard this in science fiction, <laughs> an infestation that have to be dealt with. He pulls and a Terminator, only, basically. Yeah. And, and, and you want to, uh, you know, he wants to just destroy us. And he was... And still is the Lex Luthor, the Doctor Doom, the uh, wow. the Green Goblin of the Avengers. So for me as a fan, it was thrilling to finally see him. I mean, I never thought we were going to get Avengers movies, period. <laughs> and now we're getting in the second film, we're really 
delving very deeply into the mythology of the comic and i was just thrilled i, I mean it was there was there's a lot going on and there were definitely things i had problems with but overall you know i can't deny that most of what i saw was like just uh dream come true kind of stuff for me well, not only that, but obviously you get the big set pieces, the big battles, the big baddies, but you also get a lot of character development that yeah. I guess builds up from the first film. You get to, you know, some of these background characters and some people might be complaining, oh, you don't get enough of this guy. You don't get enough of that guy or her or him. They did bring them forward, Black Widow, Hawkeye, all these extra characters that, you know, kind of, I don't want to say they're B characters. It's just that they're not taking advantage of as much. They really got a lot of airtime, a lot of face time on this movie. Yeah, and I, and, and I think it was a double-edged sword because, uh, I mean, I agree that uh, characters like Hawkeye kind of got, no pun intended, got the shaft <laughs> in, uh, in the first Avengers. But I got to be honest with you, mm -hmm. the backstory that they came up with for Hawkeye, I'm usually always in alignment with whatever Joss Whedon wants to do. But I have to say, in the case of Hawkeye, you know, my problem is always when they go too far off the map from the comic. And there was never sort of this... Uh, wife and kids kind of happy family situation mm -hmm. with Hawkeye. As a matter of fact, Hawkeye's main romantic interest in the comics was first the Black Widow and second was Mockingbird, Bobby Morse, who we see in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So oh. I, I'm not down with this. And I thought it was sort of Joss Whedon repaying Jeremy Renner for screwing him in the first <laughs> Avengers and creating this whole backstory that really has absolutely nothing to do with the comic. So in all honesty, not happy about that. My other criticism is the romance between Bruce Banner and Black Widow. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Nowhere to be found in the comic. And Whedon, again, I'm like, Joss, what are you doing? You know, his whole argument is, you know, Beauty and the Beast and okay, fine, but that doesn't necessarily mean that these characters should get together or be together. Is it uh, possible that he did that with the Hulk uh, in order to give the Hulk more motivation to want to go away? And again, we're going to talk about this, setting up the future in terms of he wants to get away from people because he understands how damaging he is to everybody. Uh, potentially, uh, you know, I, I, I don't. New. Yeah, I, and I, I don't think that that's completely out of bounds, but I do think that he just felt like I need to get to some characters together here. And again, I thought that we had been setting up sort of Cap and Black Widow maybe getting together. Yeah, but, you're right. But having said that, in Winter Soldier, they introduced uh, Sharon, who's um, oh, that's Agent right. 13, who was his primary love interest in like the 60s and 70s and whatever. I'm sure so, we're yeah, going to see her so, again. Yeah. So, yeah, and she's definitely in Civil War. So, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I just feel like they needed to give, as you pointed out, they needed to give these supporting characters something to do. These characters who don't have their own movies. But... That was my biggest problem with the movie. The other stuff, like the twins. And yeah, what the about the new characters? Tell me about because we got a a brief glimpse at them as a bonus scene in a previous film. Now they're here in the front, you know, for right. everybody to see. Eventually, they turned into good guys. Obviously, there's no big mystery. But tell me something. How do you feel about the fate of? <laughs> oh, Quicksilver. Yeah, I was disappointed because I'm like. I it's a waste of character. Well, again, you're dealing with Joss Whedon. Joss Whedon has become yeah. a little predictable. It's like Joss Whedon has to kill somebody. And I guess Marvel said, all right, you got to kill somebody, kill Quicksilver. But I was disappointed because, number one, I thought he was a good character. I, I like Aaron Taylor Johnson. I thought the way uh, I, I was really pleased. This is the thing. This Avengers film set up the team in a way that really made me happy because... It, it, it honored the comic. In the comic, the first few issues were the heavy hitters like Thor and Iron Man and Cap and Hulk and, you know, actually Ant-Man, uh, Wasp. But very quickly, then the team was completely restructured, just like the end of this movie. Yeah. And you had the character for a long time. You had the, the, the group was Cap, Hawkeye, Quicksilver, Scarlet Witch. Then Vision, Black Panther. And these are all characters that are coming, you know, that are either showed up in Avengers or are coming in Civil War. And you're going to see them. Uh, and Falcon. And so I was so excited, just to jump ahead, 
at the end of Ultron that yes, you, that team is happening and Quicksilver was a huge part of that team. So I would wanted to see more, you know, and I was just a little sad that, you know, well, well again, you know, we're dealing with comic books. So you, you, you told me this a million times, people die. Sometimes they don't always exactly yeah, die. Yeah, that's true. So, not only you know, that, but one of the biggest things I kept wanting to talk to somebody, and I might've mentioned it to you before is that, correct me if I'm wrong, but all of the visions that everybody has as a result of Scarlet Witch at first, you know, kind of zapping them with whatever it is that she has, were those visions the things that are definitely setting us up for what's coming? Everybody's personal demons and all that stuff? I think to a certain degree, especially in the case of Thor, it's really setting up his next movie. And uh, I think, yeah, to... Uh, Cap think has to, a vision and, and, yeah, and Tony think, has a vision. I think to a degree... It is some foreshadowing, you know, that that was going on. Yeah. And I actually think Joss Whedon had to sort of fight Marvel on that. I don't think they really wanted him to go too deep into that. But because, you know, he had a lot of clout, they let him do it. Wow. I also like the fact that, and again, tell me if this is what happens on the comic, that one of the first things that Ultron does, because he's a, you know, he has access to all the computer and electronics ever in the world, is he tries to access nuclear missiles, but they quickly say, no, they've been locked out, because so, it would kind of make sense. The first thing he would do is detonate yeah. every freaking missile in the world. Right. No, I, I honestly don't remember if he ever attempted that in the comic, but it made complete sense for the movie because, you know, yeah. all right, he gets the nukes, he destroys the world. End, right. of, end of movie. But there was uh, you, you just uh, an element of foreshadowing that I, I need to bring up that was gigantic was the Andy Serkis character. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, that uh, right there, Ulysses Claw, he's the number one villain <laughs> of the Black Panther. I mean, even in the comic, he didn't lose his arm to uh, Ultron, but, you know, he did lose his arm. He'll get something to replace it with that, you know, will, you know, sort of define him as a villain. And I can't wait to see what he's going to look like. But yeah, I mean, they mentioned Wakanda and that's where and Vibranium and all that stuff has to do with the Black Panther. So, and we know he's coming in Civil War and then he's getting his own movie. I love the Spader's voice as Ultron, oh. but I think... I wish there would have been more of it. In other words, he is such a good actor, and I'm so used to watching him now on The Blacklist, where he's such a juicy, juicy bastard sometimes. Yeah. And in Ultron, obviously, he's the big bad guy, but I think he kind of got a little lost. His, I think his personality got a little lost. I, I, I understood all the little references he made and the little jokes, but it was like, I wanted more of him. I wanted more of his personality yeah, and less I, of the robot almost. I agree that... The movie, if I can make another criticism of a movie that I actually loved, but it was overstuffed with characters, and I think there were you, you just lost certain characters for a long time, and then you know you finally come back to them, and I thought that actually, I don't know that Ultron had enough screen time, mm -hmm. but I think he made the most of the character, whether he was actually doing mocap or whatever, even just his voice was perfect. For that character and you know I, I i see what you're saying but i mean I, I think we definitely got enough of them if i had to say one thing or, or highlight what was my favorite element of the movie was the vision paul bettany tell us about that character were they faithful in how this character is created yeah i mean he was created by ultron and i mean that that whole part about thor and him doing that to you know that give him life no that that's mm -hmm. not but he was created by ultron and that was that complex that need to sort of procreate to be a parent yeah but of course you know he turned against him and he became a good guy again you read these comics for years and years and years and you just think in your mind well wouldn't it be great if and you when these movies start to get made and they the the big ones like superman batman spider-man they hulk they happen and that's great but then you know if you're really hardcore die hard there are these other characters that you're like oh wouldn't it be great if well that was the vision for me I just couldn't believe that I was watching a movie where the vision <laughs> came to life and was, you know, there on screen in live action form. And Paul Bettany was perfect. I mean, again, the whole setup using Jarvis as the template and Doesn't having him. Doesn't he also all... do the voice for Jarvis? 
Yeah, yeah. He's the okay. voice for Jarvis. So it all kind of flowed in its own way that, yeah, he was created by Ultron, but he has the elements of Jarvis. So it's not a complete lift from the comic, but I was just, you know, to see him with the costume and everything and the red face and all that stuff and, and his powers where he can sort of phase through people was just, I, I can't, I was thrilled. How did you feel about the big battle at the end where they're raising the city up in the air and they're going to drop it and that sort of thing? I mean, I don't know that I, that would have been my choice. I mean, obviously they wanted to do something different from the Battle of New York, but I was generally fine with it. You know, as, as long as there was crazy stuff going on and, you know, really cool battle scenes. I mean, I was generally, you know, okay, you know, this is what they're doing. You know, obviously the next one is, is outer space. So, you know, this one is still earthbound and they had to do something different from the last movie and I thought it was okay. What do you think, again, with all these visions happening and the Hulk kind of getting on a plane, do you think he's trying to go out of space? You mentioned a while back, was it Hulk Planet or something Planet like that? Planet Hulk. Planet Hulk? Yeah, um, that's What's a possibility. That, about? that that was a storyline where some heroes got together and shot him into space to kind of get him away from Earth and it was a really great storyline. But Mark Ruffalo said, and which uh, finally somebody actually came out and said it, the reason that there haven't, hasn't been a Hulk movie is because Marvel doesn't have the rights to do the Hulk standalone movie that it, they could do it, really? but they would have to do it with Universal. And I don't think they oh. want to. So I think they'd be stupid not to, especially given how popular the character is now. And after the deal they made with Sony for Spider-Man, yeah. to just freaking do it. But I, I mean, maybe they're waiting for Universal's rights to expire. But if that's not going to be for a long time, then then I don't know what the hell they're waiting for. They should make a deal because everybody loves Ruffalo. I would just think that a smart move now would be to do a movie. But I don't know what the business mindset is of, you know, them with doing a Hulk movie. You know, it, it, it seems silly not to, but, you know, it, it, there's money and billions of dollars at stake, so I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, did you watch it in 3D or regular? No, just regular. Oh, okay, I saw it in 3D. Again, I think 3D nowadays, they kind of have it down pat in terms of it's not overwhelming. It doesn't completely take you out of the movie in terms of distract you. It's very subtle. Obviously, yeah. you end up paying a few extra dollars for it, but it felt fine. It felt like before. One of the things I noticed, which I remember we talked about it when we were watching the Avengers, when we were doing the commentary, was the aspect ratio of the film. Oh. And I remember we were talking about it because it kept bothering me that when we watched it on Blu-ray, the aspect ratio seemed a little out of whack. It seemed a little not as narrow, not as wide as traditional widescreen films. Yeah. And I did a little research and apparently they did that on purpose. Uh, Whedon, for some reason, wanted to shoot it in a specific aspect ratio that would cover the entire television when you did transfer it to, you know, a, a typical HD set. Oh, that's interesting. But this time I noticed when I was watching the movie, I think they've gone back to the more wider format because okay. it gives you more to paint. It gives you a bigger palette to paint your pictures in. Right. Some people were theorizing that it was he did it on purpose because this way when you do animation, you don't have to do as much CGI because you don't have to cover a little more on the right and a little more on the left. Mm -hmm. Less rendering, less artists, less of that. I don't know if that's true or not. I, yeah. I don't know. Maybe he just, like I said, maybe he just wanted it to be able to transfer easier without having to lose material, you know, when you do the transfer. Right. Um, but again, while I was watching it, I did notice that it was a nice wide, and I'm looking at it going, if you put this on a DVD, you're going to have to give a little black on top and a little mm -hmm. black on bottom because, yeah. you know, they have to make that adjustment for it. Okay. Why don't you tell us a little bit about, if you remember, what was the bonus scene on this one? Well, the, the we call them stick. Singers now, mm -hmm. uh, those of us in the know. Oh, uh, oh excuse me. <laughs> yes. So please use the correct terminology. How dare uh, you? This particular one was uh, Thanos. They had a mid credit scene where he's just basically like, fine, I'll do it myself. And he takes out a gauntlet. And, you know, this is setting up Infinity War. This is uh, Thanos has been all about the Infinity Stones and trying to collect them all. And it hasn't been working out too well for him. So <laughs> I guess that was the whole point of that little scene. Like, all right, I have to do this myself. And, you know, 
coming in three years, you have Avengers Infinity War Part 1. They're splitting it into two movies directed by the Russo brothers. And I'm envisioning a complete battle royal. I mean, by the time this movie comes out, you're going to have more characters introduced. You'll probably have the full roster of the Avengers. You're going to have more characters. I mean, Christ, Captain America Civil War is like Avengers 2.5. I mean, everybody <laughs> in the movie... Yeah, except it's supposed to be Captain for, America, and this movie's turning into a big deal now. You don't have any... Everybody except for Hulk and Thor are going to be in the movie. And again, like I said, they set up the new team. They're all going to be in it. So, I mean, yeah, and, and you have Iron Man. I mean, it's the, we've talked about this before, the, the Civil War storyline. So, yeah, I read an interview with Charlie Cox where he said, you know, his contract includes movies. <laughs> so, you know, you could have all the Netflix characters. Oh, my God. All the char- I mean, you're going to have Spider-Man. It's going to be... Gigantic. It's like it's a mad, mad, mad world. <laughs> yeah. So I, again, you know, this is a whole other conversation. We, again, we've had this conversation. You know, DC is trying to get their movie universe off the ground. And they'll be like in the thick of it, trying, hopefully successfully for them. But I can't imagine Infinity War is going to be the most gigantic superhero movie ever made. And the scope is going to be incredible. I mean, I know what this story is about, and Thanos has always been like the number one sort of epic, galactic Marvel yeah. villain, yeah. and it'll make the first two Avengers movies look like uh, Ant-Man. <laughs> Wow. Well, you know? like you said, definitely with, with the Captain America movie, with Civil War, there, there's going to be an infusion of, of all these characters. It's going to feel like an Avenger movie, like you said. Let me ask you something. How about uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2? Are they going to get mixed up in this too somehow? I have a feeling, yes. I mean, there's not a lot of talk about it, but I have a feeling that, I mean, they've already dealt with Thanos. I think that, again, you know, they're just going to be yeah. part of the mix. I mean, I can't tell you to what extent. But I would think it would be silly to think they wouldn't be, especially because you know Marvel gets these actors for like six picture deals. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, again, it's just another group of characters you can throw into a, a huge, huge mix. And now that this movie is uh, over and done, and we already said, you already mentioned that it's that it's the Russo brothers going for the next one, the next two, actually, part one, part two. Where is Whedon in all this? He's done. He's, he's finished. He's completely, absolutely done? You know, I, I mean, maybe executive producing. I I got the sense, uh, especially since the movie's been out and the press is sort of, you know, it's not about promoting the film. Now it's more about talking about the film. I think he, he had a lot of problems with Marvel, and I think he's just as happy to be finished with these movies. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I really think he's completely done. I think he did his job. I think Marvel was happy that he did his job. But Marvel, we, we've talked about this before. Marvel is not about the directors. No. It's all about Kevin Feige. He's the guy. He's the overriding sort of Dalai Lama of Marvel. <laughs> and, uh, you know, these directors, some are more important than others. The Russo brothers, James Gunn. Whedon, but you know, a lot of them, you know, come and they go. Kenneth Branagh, Joe Johnston. Right. You don't want to, they probably don't want to create a, a Robert Downey scenario when it comes to director no. where you think they're indispensable. Right. And the closest they came was Whedon because they really had to pay him for Avengers 2. Yeah. And they, Marvel is cheap. They don't, they didn't want to, they don't want that to happen. So that means Whedon goes back to the obscurity or he will go back to I don't know where he goes. I mean, new. I hope he goes back to Firefly. <laughs> That's where I want him to go. Firefly on Netflix. That's my, you know, do TV movies. I don't give a shit. Do whatever. Do uh, miniseries. Do uh, TV movies. Get uh, Nathan Fillion off Castle and do some more Firefly. That's what I say. Well, from what I remember, this was a pretty long movie also. It, it, like you said, with all these character development scenes and stuff like that, it kind of felt a little bit bloated, maybe. Well, can't wait uh, for the next one. And obviously, as we mentioned before, we live in a time now where the next one is only like, you know, you want Marvel? Okay. You want to go to TV? You got uh, 17 hours waiting for you there. You want to go to the theater? Two, three months, you'll have another Marvel uh, exactly. franchise ready to go. You got it. Well. I want to thank Steve, first of all, for joining me today and kind of deciphering all this. Again, when I watch these movies, it's kind of like 
I'm watching them for the first time because I, again, I'm not a comic book guy. So to me, it all comes in one shot. And then I have to check with Steve and go, all right, Steve, what, what makes sense and what doesn't make sense? <laughs> so <you laughs> That's what I'm here of, for. <laughs> you have to translate these things for me. Yep. And I want to thank you guys for listening. And we will see you next time here at GeekFest Rants. Bye-bye, everybody. Could you be worthy? You're all killers. Stark. Jarvis. I'm sorry, I was asleep. Or I was a dream. Reboot. Legionnaire. That's that got a buggy suit. Terrible noise. And I was tangled in. in strings. Had to kill the other guy. He was a good guy. You killed someone? Wouldn't have been my first call. But. Down in the real world, we're faced with ugly choices. Who sent you? I see a suit of armor around the world. Ultra. In the flesh. Or no, not yet. Not this Christmas. But I'm ready. I'm on mission. What mission? Peace in our time. I mean, Chris Hemsworth, I mean, he's a big, good-looking side of beef. Oh... I'm a god and you're an ant.